Hey everyone. So let's get started with a new lecture video. And this time we are going to look at the um, intro, like we'll be talking about introduction to GCC. GCC is your GNU compiler collection. Um, you have already used GCC or already seen that in the previous lectures, but um, today it's going to be more of a formal introduction and what it does and it's going to be super important for you for the rest of the semester and for the rest of your life as well. So whenever you install something in your PC, especially in Linux, they actually use um, GCC, which is GNU compiler collection. Whenever you want to compile a C code, you are going to be using the GCC. And um, so in this lecture, we will be, well, not in this lecture, in this whole course, we will prim primarily be concerned with the C compiler, which is GCC. The program GCC is actually a front end for a suite of programming tools. And um, for the um, purpose of this course, um, the tools we have are CPP, CC, AS, and LD. CPP is the um, C preprocessor, and um, CC is the um, compiler itself. AS is the assembler, and linker is, um, well, it links the libraries with your C code. So whatever you write on the top of it with hash include. Remember, like whenever you are writing a code, like uh, whenever you are writing a code, you start with include um, stdio or something like that. It's uh, the job of a um, LD to make sure that these are connected. Okay. AS, which is the assembler. Assembler's work is to turn the um, C code into an assembly code because I have mentioned this uh, before as well that um, C codes are the closest thing you have to machine language and the um, intermediate version of it is the assembly. Okay, so yeah, let's take a better look at the GCC. I'm getting started with GCC. Download the example Caesar.c. Remember in the previous um, lecture we were talking about this caesar.c file and um, we did some like caesar in encryption. Now for example uh, to follow with me in this lecture you should be downloading that from the website and then run this command which is gcc caesar.c and see what happens. You should get um, you should not get any message. Um, list the file in your directory and you will but, well, um, this is the file I basically mean like write ls and press enter and see what whatever files are available there. You will see that a new file is available now and it's called a.out. Okay, so try to um, execute the a.out. Um, if you um, configured your path in ls1 correctly, you should be um, fine just writing a.out and pressing enter in the terminal. And if you did not do it correctly, you have to write something like dot slash a dot out. Okay, give it a try and see what happens. It will say that um, there isn't enough parameters. So um, a dot out takes two parameters. The first of them is number by which it will be shifted, and then the input file name. So uh, in the GitHub repository that is given uh, in the description well not in the description in the canvas um, download those all of those files compile it with gcc caesar.c and try to run it by doing this and if this is not running that means you didn't get your path correctly in that case try dot slash a dot a a dot out and press enter and you should see um, the encrypted version of that file okay so um you like whenever you run GCC, it's going to create a file called a dot out by default. Like this is like a um, placeholder, right? But most of the time, you do not want some file called a dot out. You want a specific name for it. So for that, you use this um, option, which is minus o. So if you write GCC minus o Caesar Caesar dot c, you will have a new file called Caesar uh, because you have specified that you want the file to be named Caesar. Okay, so one thing is very important over here. If you mistakenly wrote like GCC minus O 
um, Caesar dot C. It will delete your source code and replace it with the object file. And you honestly do not want that to be happening. So make sure whenever you are using minus O, make sure that you have put the <coughs> name of the new file you want it to be. Because whatever comes right after this minus O is going to be the name of the executable file. This is very important. Many of the times students forget that there is going to be a name for the executable file and they mistakenly uh, mention their um, source code and it's overwritten and they have to start all over again. So um, in order for you to not face that, make sure that whenever you write minus O, you have the name of the executable file, okay? Now we are going to use another option, which is minus W on. You can call it wall if you want, but it's basically warning on, okay? So if your code has some sort of air, um, warnings, like they are not errors, but they are something you should get fixed to keep your code um, clean. In that case, you will be using um, W all, which is which means um, show me all the warnings. Okay. So um, in this example, particular example, if you use wall, you will see this particular warning. It will say that uh, in the function called process file it will specify which line it is happening over here and it says which column. Usually you should be just focusing on the line. It says that the impl implicit declaration of the function is alpha, okay? So it basically means that it is using a function called is alpha, but it was never actually um, declared. So from this, you know that maybe you forgot to write the function or you are using a function that doesn't exist or something like that. So it gives you some sort of like a direction that there might be something wrong with your code. Sometimes the warnings are very harmless, but like um, whenever you see a warning in your code, make sure you try to fix it. But when you are working with, with a like bigger type of um, project and you will have like thousands of warning, in those cases maybe you will have to ignore the warnings because if you try to fix that, maybe you will break your code even worse than it was before. Uh, I mean, that's one problem every single programmer goes through. Like they try to fix one error and create 10 more. That's not you, that's literally everyone in this world. But um, trying to keep your code warning free is a good practice, but even if you cannot do it, uh, it's totally fine, okay? So the supply, um, C code compiles but does not compile cleanly. Uh, with cleanly we mean that there is still some warning and you should try to keep it as clean as possible. The first message tells us that um, there is a function that is um, implicitly declared, right? So this is true and um, the is alpha is declared in the header file called c type.h and the supply code doesn't have that include uh, directive in the header. In this case, we got away with it, but the issue should be fixed. So at the top of the code, you should have something like include, I keep doing that mistake, include C type dot H. If you put that, then this particular warning will be gone. So there are other warning uh, options you have, which are going to be pretty useful, but we will be using mostly uh, wall and W. We have the uh, W format, uh, warnings regarding the mismatches between format specifier and arguments. It is uh, more helpful for like printf and scanf. There is warning re uh, re regarding unused variables. Like you um, declared a variable, but you never used it. Maybe that's some sort of problem. Maybe you didn't need the variable in the first place, who knows? There is the um, W implicit warnings regarding the functions that are called without being declared, like the one you just saw, W conversion, maybe some sort of typecasting didn't go well, um, W shadow warning regarding name hiding. Uh, name hiding is kind of like um, overriding or overloading in Java and um, in C, overriding or overloading isn't as simple as you think it is. Overloading doesn't even exist. Uh, overload exists, overriding doesn't exist, if I remember it correctly. Okay, and 
MW means it is going to do all of the warnings that is not included in uh, wall. So if you use W and W wall, you are basically um, using all of them at once. So you can just make use of these options and you should be fine. Okay. In most of the examples I show you in this course, they will mostly consist of W and W wall. And if I never specify which ones you should be using, you can just assume that these are the warnings you should be using. So we have the W as, and like I mentioned, as you can see, I'm using wall and W. And if we use that, we see that there is an unused parameter, which is shift AMT. If you look at the code right now, you will see that we never made use of this parameter and it definitely is wrong, right? So um, the function uh, apply shift isn't correctly implemented and that's why you are getting this error. So take a look at that, maybe change it to how it should be. So um, not all warnings are um, benign, like some warnings are actually very dangerous. For example, we are doing something like A equals five, B equals 10, and we are trying to print it, but you can see that this is an integer, which is A, right? This is another integer, which is B. But this is a floating point, but we are printing A plus B. If you try to print it, it's going to print something very weird. Uh, it's not, it may not print something correct. For example, uh, if we try five, if, if we try running it, we get five, 10, but the output is zero point something. Why did that happen? It happened because we used a floating point specifier instead of um, decimal point specifier. And it was actually mentioned in the warning. The warning said that um, we are using percent %f for which is expecting a double, but we are getting an int. So whenever you see uh, warnings like this, you have to make sure that you are fixing it. I mean, um, your code will work, but the output will not be as what you expected. So another option we have in GCC is the STD. STD basically means the standard you are going to use. And um, in this course and onward in the later courses, you will be using the C11 standard. So you have to specify whenever you're compiling a code, you should be specifying which standard you are using. Uh, in, for example, in this case, we're using STD equals C11. So by doing this, we are telling the compiler that we are using the um, standard of C11. If you do not use that, it will say that the for loop does not work or something like that. Um, it is also necessary with some legacy code in order to sidestep requirement imposed by the newer standards. Like there are some legacy codes which will um, be using previous standards. In that case, you have to specify that, um, for example, if you use a very old code like from the 90s, you will have to specify like STD equals C99. Unless explicitly, explicitly stated in CS2505, we will always specify the compliance with the C99 standard, okay? Or like we, we, uh, most of the time I will specify that it's going to be C11, but if it's not specified, then you can expect it to be C99. For more information about GCC references, you can go to this website and it will have the full documentation. Um, it's something you don't necessarily have to go and check, but it's for better understanding of C or like how the compiler works and everything. So let's see what happens um, behind the scene. Like what is GCC doing for us with just the one command GCC? Executing GCC with the save temps options result in the um, preservation of some of the temporary intermediate files created by or for the underlying tools. For example, if you use the file caesar.c and if you use this, um, this option, save temps, you will see that there are some intermediate files that are usually not stored, but in this case, they are stored. The minus i is the pre-processed uh, pre um, file. The minus uh, point s, sorry, dot s is the assembly part. The dot O is the one with the um, linker, and the last one is the one you specified to be your object file. By default, only the final executable file is preserved once the process is complete. 
we will gradually see the intermediate files are occasionally of use if for no reason that um, sorry if for no reason then that they shed light on the actual process of program translation from high level language to machine level language we will see step by step what they look like so the first thing we are going to do is pre-process the file okay um, try to follow me with this one run cpp caesar.c and then write this one this is the uh, input redirection if you remember correctly if it says this then um, write something in a file um, if it says this then take input from a file in this case we are writing something in the caesar.i okay so um, cpp writes its output to a standard output um, this redirects into a new file named um, caesar.i because we use the io redirection try to open the file and see how it looks like if you examine the file the first 2000 or something line is the processing of the include directives in the source file so declaration of those files are available to the compiler so remember how we start with like um, include std io.h so if you do this pre-processing you will notice that the include isn't there anymore and it will be filled with thousands um, thousands of lines of code it what it did did was basically replace the stdio.h with the actual source code okay at the end of the file you will find the modified copy of the original source code all the comments have been stripped out the values that were defined in the source file have been substituted into the source code okay so it is basically like um, turning it into a intermediate process where everything that were supposed to be replaced with something is replaced with that then try running cc minus s caesar.i okay so with the minus s option and remember it's um, capital s not small s the compiler writes its output file um, and sorry the compiler writes its output to a file the file is generated from the name of the input file in this case as it is named caesar.i it's going to be named caesar.s this file contains the assembly code generated by the compiler from preprocess c source code um, you can take a look at it right now but honestly most of it won't make sense to you later in this uh, course you will see how assembly works and then it will make way much more sense to you okay then try um, as minus o caesar dot o caesar dot s the assembler writes its output to a dot o by default but over here we are specifying minus o so it's going to put everything to uh, caesar dot o this file contains a partial translation of the assembly code into a native machine language code calls to library functions have not resolved completely since the code for those in is not in the local source file so um everything where like everywhere where you need the linker like um you know getting functions from a different file or something those weren't will not be resolved but other than that everything will look like a more machine language so it will be mostly zeros and ones if you try to open it maybe you will see it in a hexadecimal format or just like zeros and ones or maybe you won't be able to open the file in the first place but give it a try and see what happens then we have to use the ld which basically resolves all the um, files that are not available to your local code which is basically the library functions that are you are making use of for example printf scanf or everything like that so um, we went through like four or five steps. So whenever you run GCC minus O, um, all those processes are being done in, like, in one way. You don't have to worry about the intermediate stuff that has happened. So um, there are other uh, useful options for GCC, for example, minus LM. This is used for some of the um, libraries such as mat.h. Uh, you have already seen that being used. There is the standards. There is O N, where it, where N is one, two, three, zero, and such. This is for debugging. Later on this course, you will see what they mean. N thirty two means it's going to be built as a thirty two bit program. 
M64 means it's going to be built as a 64-bit program. Okay, again, those uh, will be explained later in this course. Um, you probably won't understand right now if I explain it to you because you need more understanding of the um, assembly organization and all of those. Okay, and this is for uh, debugging, which will be um, explained soon enough. But these are the options that are available for you. So that's it for the GCC introduction. I think, I hope it made sense to you. Again, if you don't understand any of these concepts or if you want to know more about these concepts or if you want to want me to cover more of this stuff, let me know, okay? I'll see you in the next video.